Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His. In I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may not stand, whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Your rich love and your slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart. Brothers and sisters, I pause at this moment to welcome you to church this morning. As a matter of fact, I should say I welcome the church to church this morning. I am very excited that God has spared our lives and have brought us into his sanctuary where we come to worship him. It is my prayer that he would be with us as we ask him to for the rest of the day and that all of us, our hearts would be knitted and uh, be blessed. Again, church, welcome to church. Amen. I didn't hear you say amen. amen. I need to hear it now. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, we are now ready to begin our celebration of worship to the Lord. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness worship the lord in the beauty of holiness we will go to the lord in prayer as we ask him to be present in our worship and to lead our worship 
I invite our brother and a friend to come at this time and to pray. Brother Michael is coming. Can we stand at this time? So as we look to God in prayer, let us remember the lost and the dying. Those who are not necessarily our family members or friends who are yet to give their life to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, ruler of this universe, King of kings and Lord of lords, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, the God of yesterday and today. I want to thank you, Lord, for sparing our lives to see this, the dawn of a new day, a day that we've never seen before. One, Lord, that we seek to give you praises and to lift up your name for all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for sparing our lives despite many atrocities. We ask, God, that you continue to bless us individually and collectively. I pray even now, Lord, for those who are here. You have extended our lives to this moment, and for that we are grateful. I pray right now, Lord, for those who are on their way to church. We're here, God, but for one reason, and that is to praise you. I thank you, Lord, for delivering us from bondage, for setting our minds free, for causing us to realize and accept you as Lord and Savior. Because, Lord, without you, we are nothing. And without you, we are bound to fail. And so, Lord, to that extent, we put you before us and let ourselves be a base. We lift up our hands and we lift up our praises unto you, God. Because you're high and lifted up. We come against every insecurity right now. Every fear, every bondage, everything that is not of you. We ask, God, that you'll devour every unclean spirit. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. I pray, O oh God, that as we enter into the kingdom of God, as we enter into these doors, that, God, you will lift up a countenance against the enemy. Father, we love you. We lift up your name. We praise you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Hallelujah. Your name is to be praised. Yes, Lord. I pray, O oh God, that worship will become easy. Yes, yes, Lord. Touch the yes. music. Touch our voices yes, Lord. as yes. we lift up your name on high. God, we deliver your manservant in this place. Yes, Lord. Give him a word for your Jesus. people at a time the like this. Violence, O oh God, has come upon the land, yes. but give your people the fear, O oh God, yes, of Lord. you, but Amen. not of man. Yes. Cause us, O oh God, to lift up thank our you. voices yes. and to praise you. Yes. Yes. Father, thank we thank you for everything that you've done. You. And those things that you promised to do, mm. O oh God, deliver us out of the hands of the enemy. I thank you, God, that as we are gathered here this morning, that you will keep us in one accord. Bind us together in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, my brother, for invoking the presence and the blessings of God on our worship today. We will join the praise group in this moment of praise as we lift praises to our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Please 
open your mouths open your hearts and let us praise our king of kings and our lord of lords may i invite you to stand please to give praise to god i wanted to shout three praise to god i wanted to shout three hallelujahs Hallelujah. 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 Bless the name Bless of Jesus. All right. Jesus. He didn't hear the first one. So let's shout that hallelujah again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Hallelujah. Jesus. Bless the name of Jesus. They're ready to lead you in praise and we're ready to praise with them. I'm no longer a slave to fear for I am child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. For my mother's me, you have chosen me.
asking you now to put your hands together and we're going to clap them we're going to give praise high praise to god the bible said we must worship him on the high sounding timbrels we must worship him with song and dance let everything that hath breath praise the lord we're just going to praise the lord with choruses at this time just lift up the name of jesus praise the lord wonderful wonderful jesus is to me
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Bless the name. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody just lift your hands and give a praise to God. Give a praise to God in church today. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He deserves every praise Hallelujah. we give to him. Every praise to our God. We are worshiping in one accord. Hallelujah. So we must give praise to Almighty God. We want to hear now what God has to say to us through his word. Let us hear one of the experiences of the Bible. From the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1 to 6 let's hear again one of the experiences this is an experience of david oh it's a sad experience at first but thank god we serve a forgiving god amen a gracious god a compassionate god a God who does not treat us as our sin deserved that we be treated. Let's hear what the Bible say. Praise God. May God be pleased to add his richest blessings to the reading of his holy words. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when king go forth to battle, and David went to Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroy the children of Ammon and besiege Rahab. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Six and last, and David said unto Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. This is the word of the Lord. And we will hear more of what happened as a result of David's action and how God treat with it. We sing the hymn 464, it will be projected. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. May I request that we stand, please, as we extend our lounge and sing this song. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day he's There's not a friend like the Lord, he Jesus. Yeah, no. 
the Lord. Amen. You may be seated please. There's no other friend like Jesus. There are many friends. There are good friends and likely not so good friends. But the greatest friend, the one who can see us through life, the one who pilots us through life. The only one who can supply all our needs in life is Jesus. What a friend he is. We can confide in him. We can tell him anything. And we are sure that he won't let us down by passing on the information to anyone else. Isn't it nice that we can go to him with some secret that we can't tell anybody else? Amen. What a friend. What a precious friend. So complete. So divine. If we walk the whole world over, not another will be able to find. We're privileged this morning to have with us Brother Paul and his team from Whitestone and likely some other Nazarene family. We want to thank God Brother Paul has fallen in love with Jamaica and all who came before with him have fallen in love with Jamaica and they have said to others, Jamaica is another home of ours and therefore whenever Paul, you're going back to Jamaica. Remember, we have family like you have in Jamaica. Therefore, we are returning and we are coming back. We, whether you come, yes or no, Paul, we are going because we have family here in Jamaica. We have made them and uh, we are going to be there with them and for them. I now not only welcome Paul, but I would like him to come and to bring greetings on behalf of the White Zone Church of the Nazarene and any other. Good morning. morning. It is great to be here worshiping with you again. Um, COVID really took its toll on us, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we were here in 2017 and 2018, 2019. We're coming back in 2020, in May of 2020. But guess what happened in March of that year? And I, it's hard to fathom, but it's four years since we've been here. Four years. And um, we have a team with us today and uh, uh, that is 14 members. And among us, we have 12 Nazarenes and two Baptists, all right, from, from a local church. That's right. And so, um, is it appropriate that I bring them forward? Do you want to bring them forward? Or? Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce them to you. Uh, but before I do that, Jimmy Jackson, the senior pastor of the Whitestone Church of the Nazarenes, sends his greetings and blessings. Um, uh, Jimmy uh, is a great friend, and uh, I, can, I can tell you this, when we left yesterday morning at 7 a.m., 
he and his wife and several of our church members were there to see us off and send their personal regards. So let me introduce the team members to you. Um, we have several first-time members, first time um, uh, with us this time, and each year we've come, we've had 14, 15, 20 people. And uh, we have some returns, and we have a many new. And it be my joy and pleasure one day to see if we can get everyone who's ever come with us here to come back as one large team. But your mission house couldn't hold us. Amen. Amen. It would be a great problem, wouldn't it, Pastor? So uh, first-time members, and you can just stand as I call your name, and you can sit down again because I know it's embarrassing. Alyssa Meadows, Bradley Walker, Suzanne Carson, John McCrillis, Tom Camp, and his son Tom Camp. Both have the same name, so they're easy to remember. Just call him Tom. Seamus Fearing, and Grayson Clark. On either their second or their third trip here is Grace Holly. And I got to tell you about a story about Grace. The day she gets back home, she starts saving for the next trip because she is in love with you and your culture. Stand up again, Grace. It's hard to see Grace, but there she is. I think, I think she would come and live with you all if we let her. <laughs> and we have uh, Fred Burke from Irvington Baptist Church. He's, he's been with us. Third time, Fred? Third time, Paul Harris from uh, Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia. He's, Paul, third time too? Second time, second time is with us. Paul has a, uh, uh, a niece that uh, is a missionary in Africa, or was a missionary in Africa. And he has gone to Africa and other places around the world 20, 30, 25, 30 times on short-term mission trips. He, uh, he loved the trip the last time he was here. He re-upped again for this one. And then my friend Rich Ferraro. This is Rich's uh, second tri trip here. But there's one guy that I haven't talked about yet. And he's the guy that's going to deliver a message to you this morning. But I want to tell you about Jeff. About 23, 24 years ago, I became a member of the uh, Whitestone Church of the Nazarene. And as I was there, my daughter, Amanda, was 15 years old when we joined. Now, Jeff was promoting a trip to Guatemala. And Mandy came home and told her mom, I want to go on that mission trip with Pastor Jeff. And my wife said to me, Paul, she wants to go on that trip, but I don't want, to go, I don't want her to go by herself. I want you to go with her. And I'm saying to myself, you know, I've never been called into the mission field. That's just not me. In fact, I was the treasurer of a Baptist church before we joined the Nazarene church. And we were having some budget struggles, like I'm sure you guys do. And I proposed to cut the mission's budget. I had this little lady about this high, about Grace's height, could walk up to me that day. And she said, Paul, you can cut anything else you want in this budget, but as long as I'm alive, you will never cut the mission's budget. Yeah. And so here I am, less than a year later, the Lord telling Karen that I wanted to come into the mission field. 
and speaking through that man right there to my daughter that Paul needs to go. Well, you know how husbands and wives are. Next thing I know, I'm buying a ticket to Guatemala. And uh, we didn't end up in Guatemala. We ended up in Costa Rica. But it changed my life forever. And that of my daughters. My two daughters are not here this time, but they've been here twice previously with me. And so Jeff was behind that. And uh, I can tell you this. I'm going to go back a little bit more in history. The Whitestone, Virginia, 25, 26 years ago, did not have a, Na a Nazarene church. But it had two very successful building contractors that were building the houses in the area, and they were Nazarenes. They were traveling about 40 miles to go to church one way each day. So they went to the district superintendent, and they said, we want to plant a church in Whitestone, Virginia. And the DS looks at Jeff and his brother Jim and said, OK, which one of you guys is going to be the pastor? <laughs> and they changed their lives. Uh, Jimmy now has been the senior pastor of the Whitestone Church, uh, church of the Nazarene. How many years, Jeff? 26, 25? But Jeff had a different calling. Jeff's calling was to the mission field. He has been on, I, I talked to him yesterday about it, 104 Nazarene work and witness trips. 104. And not only that, he works with several organizations getting Bibles and teaching materials to countries around the world that are hard to reach, where you can't lift this Bible up in public without being persecuted. So he's received his calling. He also became an ordained ma uh, pastor in the Church of the Nazarene. And Jeff will be giving the message this morning. And I got to also tell you that I've been on a number of trips over the years, um, many of them with Jeff. But this is the first time in 20-some years that I am leading the trip with Jeff on it, and he's not. So, and he's been very gracious about it. He's only criticized me a few times. So, so, so anyway, I will be, um, um, he will be your uh, speaker here in a couple of minutes. But I did want to share a verse out of Romans. Um, that I shared with the team uh, not too long ago, as it just struck me coming here um, on this island and about the 13, 14, 15 trips that I've been on. And it's out of the um, a, uh, eighth chapter of Romans, a uh, 10th chapter of Romans, beginning in verse eight. It says, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message uh, concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and with your heart that you believe, you are then justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. The scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How then can they believe in the one whom that they have never heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, 
How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Thank you, and let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, I can tell you that this entire team is thankful that we're here worshiping with this wonderful people in Jamaica this morning. And Lord, we ask that you bless them richly and you bless our team and keep them safe during their journey. And Lord, I pray that we can build relationships that will cross time this week. And I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Paul, for coming, and thank you for introducing your team. We have some work that it's become very, very important for us to do. The government has uh, asked us, the Ministry of Education, through their inspectorate and others, have asked us to um, put more windows in the school building for more air and more lighting. Uh, it's a, at a cost. The government, the Ministry of Education is not providing for that. So Paul and his team will be doing that. The NASTEC, we are looking at um, the electrical installation room, and uh, they are going to be taking on that. We're also going to, we are part of community, and where the community is now engaged in building a community uh, area where spectators can see better and so forth and so on the team will also be engaged in that because we cannot we're part of a community and we have to remain part of a community and so we we are thankful that god has sent them to us they're helping us to do what will take a long time for us to do and you know the reason for that so we say thanks again for coming we want to continue to say thanks to God for those of you who are here this morning who have not been here for a while. You know, uh, Brother Michael have not been here for a while. His heart is here. He wants to be here. But you see, his work does not allow him to be here where he is all the time. You know, he is in the, in the force, we know, and uh, he has to make sure that he is at work he's at the post so brother smichael we want to say how happy we are for you being here we did see sister smichael but we did not see your daughter for a while and we want to say how proud of how privileged and how happy we are that you are here other members who have not been here for a while because of sickness or health related problem we are happy that you have come today and we look forward to a great time as we worship the Lord together. Before the word of God comes to us, there are some things that uh, we should have last week we started doing, but unfortunately um, we did not have enough. We will give them today. Deand Deandra is going to be giving her testimony following the message. Because you see, the church, it doesn't matter what service you're having. If you're having church, if you're having service, and no one is coming uh, as into the membership of the church, into the kingdom, then uh, there is uh, a challenge. But today, God has saved uh, Deandra. God is returning her to the fold of God. And I want with you to bring her into the fold. So following the message today, she is going to be brought into the fold. We're going to ask Brother Durban today. He's going to be ministering to us in song. And after his ministering song, then the servant of God, Pastor, will be coming to share the word of God. All right, thank you very much, Brother Dermot. After which, Pastor. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord another time. That is ready to be praised. Hallelujah. 
The woman needed healing of the dreaded disease. All her money her brought physician, but only Jesus could bring relief. Though her last thread of hope was worn down to the strand, her heart held on to faith till she could touch him with her hands. Oh, when you're hanging by the thread, still you can climb life's mountains though the cliffs are rough and jagged you can call oh if you should slip and reach your sand you will find the hem of his garment so don't let go of a last thread of hope Try hanging, hanging on to a frail and fragile faith. But are you clinging to the rocks above the canyons of this main? Reach out for the lifeline, it will never break in two. Hold fast, don't lose hope For once again, God will pull you through When you're hanging by the thread Still you can climb life's mountains Though the cliffs are rough and jagged You can call if you should slip and reach your sin, you will find the aim of this garment. So don't let go of the last thread of hope. Oh, you try hanging, hanging on to a frail and fragile faith. But are you clinging to the rocks above the canyons of this May? Reach out for the lifeline, it will never break in two. Hold fast, don't lose hope, for once again, God will pull you through. Thread. You can climb life's mountains, though the cliffs are rough and jagged. You can call if you should slip and reach ropes, and you will find the hero of his garment. So don't let go. I feel less red of hope. Oh, when you're hanging by the thread, you can climb life's mountains. Though the cliffs are rough and jagged, you can call. Oh, if you should slip and reach your sand. You will find the hem of his garment. So don't let go of the last thread of hope. Oh, when you're hanging by the thread, still you can climb life's mountains. Though the cliffs all rough and jagged you can call if you 
should slip and reach ropes and you will find the hem of the hem of Christ's garment. If you should slip and reach ropes and hallelujah. If you should slip yes. and reach ropes and you will find the hem of the hem of Christ's garment. Don't let go. Yes. Don't let go of a last rain of hope. Hallelujah. Oh, if you should slip and reach hopes and Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor, Pastor, your time, sir. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. That was beautiful. Very beautiful. It is an honor for me to be here. I want to greet all of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And those of you watching out there, I greet you too. Pastor, you said those came back here to Jamaica because they fell in love with Jamaica. I say it's possible in less than 24 hours to fall in love with Jamaica because I'm proof of that. So thank you for your warm welcome, for the beautiful service we've had so far. And we're going to get into God's word. We read this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I won't take the time to, to read it again, but I hope you still have it open in your Bibles, because we're going to be touching on that uh, off and on. But before we get into this, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we are so happy to be in this place this morning. We pray that our worship has brought a smile to your face today. We have sung that we are no longer slaves, but we are your children. And as your children this morning, Lord, we come with open hearts. And we ask, Lord, that you will reach into our hearts today and teach us more about your love for us through your word. Help us, Lord, to see you in a different way today. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think that most of us here today are probably familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. Maybe some of us not so much. But when we talk about this story, we have a tendency to focus on David and his sin and his attitude in this situation. And we'll touch on that to some extent. But I like to look at this story today through a different lens, through a different set of eyes. I'd like to look at it with the perspective or the mind of Uriah the Hittite. Who was Uriah the Hittite? The Bible mentions him enough times that we catch a glimpse of who this man was. The name Uriah actually means the flame of God. Yes. It is believed that Uriah came from the Hittite people who were located in the part of the world that is known as Turkey today. Many scholars believe that Uriah came to David 
when David was on the run from King Saul and joined David's army of misfits and converted to Judaism. 1 Samuel chapter 22 speaks of 400 men joining up with David at this time, and he became the captain over them. The Hittites were known for their abilities in battle, and Uriah excelled in this area as well. He is listed among David's mighty men or warriors at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 23. David had surrounded himself with a loyal band of mercenaries, some of them being foreigners. The exploits of these men, these warriors, are recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. It reads like some kind of superhero movie, only their experiences actually happened. They killed giants. They killed lions. Some killed 300 at a time by themselves. They spent years together in battles, on the run, and in peacetime. They had formed a strong brotherhood that only those who have experienced it could understand. Uriah was one of that brotherhood and a part of David's inner circle of elite guards. There is a story found in 2 Samuel chapter 23 where the Philistines were camped within Bethlehem, David's old hometown. And David and his men were camped outside of the town. And the Bible says in verse 15 of that chapter that David said this with longing in his voice, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. David was thirsty, and he knew which well had the best water in Bethlehem, but he was just speaking his mind because he knew there was no, it was impossible to get to this well because of the Philistine army camped around it. But then the Bible tells us that three of David's mighty men rose up and broke through the camp of the enemy, risking their own lives, got a glass of water from that well, and brought it back to David so he could drink it. That's crazy stuff. Even crazier was that when they gave that drink to David, he didn't drink it, but he poured it out on the ground as an offering to the Lord. That sounds rather cruel to do to these three men who just risked their lives to get you a, a glass of water. But David was sending a message to them. If he had drunk that water, he would have been telling his guys that you only exist to satisfy me and my needs, and that my comforts mean more than the value of your lives. So David poured it out to God. Those three got the message. Many believe that Uriah was one of those three men and saw that example of sacrifice that David presented. We'll see why in a few minutes. We started with the passage from 2 Samuel 11 that told us that David sent his army out for war under the command of his general named Joab while David sat this one out. David was about 50 years old at this time, still young enough to be out there with the guys, and he usually was, but for some reason decided to stay home this particular spring and not join his comrades in the fight. We need to be careful in our spiritual lives not to sit this one out while our brothers and sisters are in the midst of the fight. Spiritual laziness can begin to lead to a lot of problems if we're not real careful. The devil will always look for an open door to bring us down. Amen. Do you think the devil wanted to bring David down? Or all the things that he had done for God? Of course he did. Yes. David opened the door by not going out with his men like he should have. And as David had a lot of time on his hands, he got bored one night and got up and went up to the flat roof to walk around a little bit and en enjoy the spring breeze. The Bible doesn't tell us that David went up there to pray for his men or to write some psalms, only that he went up there to walk around. Being the king's house, I'm sure it was higher than all the others. And from there, you could look down on all the other surrounding houses and check out what's going on. Be careful if you ever find yourself in a position of looking down into other people's lives. Yeah. It's a dangerous position to be in if we're not spiritually alert. 
David was not being spiritually alert. Then steps out Bathsheba to take a bath. David sees her and can see her well enough to know that she was extremely beautiful. This tells us that Uriah's house was very close to David's house, which shows you how close Uriah was to King David. At this moment, David was presented with a choice. He could say, wow, she's very beautiful, but I already have several wives and a bunch of concubines that I probably shouldn't have. I better go back inside and give her some privacy. Or he could say, wow, she's beautiful. I think I'll stay here and watch her for a while because I find her enjoyable to look at. And besides, I'm the king. If David had chosen the first option, we never would have heard of this story at all. But he didn't. We are presented with temptations in our own lives and are given choices to walk away or to give in to them. It's very difficult to walk away from them if we've been lazy in our spiritual life. David chose the second option, and my guess is that he lingered on that roof watching Bathsheba for her whole bath until she went back inside or was done. David became consumed by lust to the point of trying to find out who she was. And listen to how they told David who this woman was in verse 3. It says, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Whoever it was that told David this was trying to snap David out of his state of mind and warn him by telling David she has a name, she is someone's daughter, and she is your good friend's wife. But David didn't hear any of that. He had reduced Bathsheba to an object for his own pleasure. That's what lust does. It dehumanizes. Let me speak to the men here just for a second, if that's okay. Be very careful how you look at the opposite sex. God has made some very beautiful women. Don't be blinded by lust and reduce them to objects. Remind yourself that they have a name, that they are someone's daughter, and they're probably someone else's wife. King David heard none of this and betrayed his loyal subject, Uriah, by taking his wife and sleeping with her. After all Uriah had done for David over the years to help him get to the throne, David threw it away for one night of passion. I don't know if David thought no one would find out, but the Bible tells us that he had sent messengers to Bathsheba. What type of godly example was that to these messengers? But David wasn't alone in his escapade. Many times I've heard that Bathsheba gets a free pass in this whole scenario, that she's just an innocent victim. Maybe she was innocent when she was taking her bath that night, but when David's messengers showed up at her front door, she was presented with a choice of her own. She could have said, wow, I'm flattered the king is inviting me to his house in the middle of the night, but my husband is away, and it would be best if I just stay here. Or she could say, wow, how nice to be invited to the king's house in the middle of the night. My husband's out of town. I think I'll go. What could happen? She chose the second option. Some will say that you can't refuse the king's request. You can. You may pay a price for refusing the king, but you would still have your honor. But the Bible doesn't mention that Bathsheba resisted in any way. In fact, it says she came to him. Now let me talk to the ladies for just a minute, since I've already talked to the guys. Be very careful in your relationships with men, especially if you're married. Other men can be appealing due to their status or emotional connection that you think you find in them that you may not find in your own husband. That is a very dangerous game to play. And if played long enough, it can have devastating effects on many lives. So Uriah has been betrayed by his boss, King David, and now by his wife, 
Bathsheba. And then it gets worse. Because of their one night stand, Bathsheba finds out that she's pregnant. She lets David know the situation, and David is going to take care of it. David sends a message to his general Joab to send Uriah the Hittite to come see him. David figures if he just sends Uriah to his house for a day or two, he'll surely sleep with Bathsheba, and everyone will think her pregnancy is from Uriah and not him. By the way, there's no sign of protest from, from Bathsheba in this plane if she knew about it. So Uriah shows up at the king's house. David engages with Uriah in some small talk before David tells Uriah to go home and relax. David even sends some food as a gift to make Uriah stay even more enjoyable. The problem for David was Uriah never went home, but he stayed with the king's servants and slept at the door of the king's house. When David was told this, he brought Uriah in the next day to find out why he didn't go home. And here is what Uriah told his king and his friend. The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and my soul lives, I will not do this thing. Now, where did Uriah learn about that type of sacrifice? Perhaps when he watched a glass of water being poured out as an offering to the Lord with the lesson that others' lives are more important than my own comforts. Yes. Yeah. And my satisfaction and needs don't come first. Perhaps Uriah learned this from his trusted and his godly boss, King David. But David didn't catch on. And he had Uriah over the next day as well. They ate and they drank in the king's house. And David got Uriah drunk and then sent him home. But once again, Uriah didn't go home, but slept at the door of the king's house with his servants. Even drunk, Uriah had more integrity than David. I'm sure when David heard that Uriah didn't go to his house again the second time, that he didn't sleep much that night, and he cooked up another plan to get rid of his problem. David writes a letter to his general Joab to put Uriah in the front lines of the hottest battle and then back away from him and leave him exposed. David rolls up that letter and he seals it with the king's stamp and he hands it to Uriah to deliver to Joab. Think about that. David knows that Uriah is trustworthy enough not to open that letter, but will deliver it to Joab. Uriah ends up carrying his own death sentence to Joab. I have often wondered what went through Joab's mind when he opened that letter from his king. The Bible never mentioned that he questioned it at all. Joab carried out the instructions just how David drew it up. Uriah found himself back with his trusted comrades in arms, the guys he had been in countless battles with, together again in the heat of the fight. And then they just backed away. And they left Uriah practically on his own. Uriah is now betrayed by his closest friends and his trusted general and is killed in battle. And it isn't just Uriah. Verse 17 tells us that several others were killed as well in this betrayal. Joab sends word back to King David about the death of Uriah the Hittite. And David sends back word to Joab that basically says, hey, these things happen. When Bathsheba hears the news, she mourns for Uriah. But when the days of mourning were over, David sends for her, and she becomes another one of David's wives. David had fixed the problem that he had gotten himself into, or so he thought. The last sentence of this tragic chapter 11 says this, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. That word displeased actually means that what David did was evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
By the way, this is the first time the Lord is mentioned in the whole chapter. He is literally the last word in the chapter. No one reached out to God. No one prayed to God. No one consulted God. And no one repented to God. They all did their own thing and thought they had left God out of the situation. What a mess we get ourselves into when we leave God out of our lives and we save him as a last resort. None of the people involved in this whole scheme bothered to check with God to see if they were heading down the wrong track. It's important for all of us to keep re be reminded to be in constant communion with our Lord to keep us from getting so far off track. This is such a tragic story, especially if your name's Uriah the Hittite. You were betrayed by your boss, the king, who you've trusted. You're betrayed by your wife, who you took lifelong vows with. You're betrayed by your closest friends, brothers you've sacrificed with together and spent your glory days with. Uriah never saw it coming. But why would he be looking for it? David, according to the Bible, was supposedly a man after God's own heart. Why would he betray Uriah? Why would Uriah think that David would put his own comforts and satisfaction ahead of the value of someone else's life? That's not the David that Uriah knew. I can tell you this morning that most of us in this room today have been betrayed in one way or another by someone close to us, and we never saw it coming. It could be our boss, our co-worker. It could be from a spouse or a family member or it could be from one or more of our closest friends. And we never saw it coming. Why would we? We trusted them and could never believe that they could do something like they did to us. In fact, we still have a hard time believing it today. The situation may have happened years ago, but have we ever finished dealing with it? How have we handled it? In our story, it looked like David got away with it. Uriah is dead. David had put out the, the flame of God in Uriah and basically in his own spiritual life. And now David has Bathsheba. But the Lord steps in and uses a prophet to finally wake David up. God sends the prophet Nathan to tell David a story about a very rich man who had all kinds of flocks and herds and a poor man who had one little lamb. The poor man loved this little lamb, and he fed it his own food, and he slept with it, and it was like a daughter to him. And then the story tells us that a traveler came to the rich man, and instead of preparing one of his lambs for this guest from his great flocks for the traveler to eat, he took the poor man's one little lamb and prepared it for the traveler. As Nathan told this story to David, the Bible says that David's anger was greatly aroused. And David proclaimed that the rich man deserves to die and should restore to the poor man four times what he took because he had no pity on this man. It wasn't until Nathan said, you are the man, that David realized what he had done to Uriah. David repented deeply to the Lord for what he had done and the Lord graciously forgave him. But the rest of David's life was an absolute mess. He had to live with the consequences of his actions. He even had his own judgment of restoring four times back fulfilled by losing four of his own sons in his lifetime. He lost the baby that Bathsheba was carrying. He lost a second son named Amnon. He lost Absalom, his third son. And he lost a fourth son named Adonijah all killed, all four of them, during David's life. A very costly payback for his actions against Uriah the Hittite. Plus, David's personal life stayed in a constant state of turmoil for the rest of his life. Did David get away with his betrayal and actions? No. One thing we can learn is this. A disobedient life is a troubled life. A disobedient life is a troubled life. Amen. Even after repentance, we may still have to deal with the consequences of what we've done. What about your story? Does it look like your betrayer got away with what they did to you? 
you can be sure that the Lord knows all about it. But how are you say Uriah never got the chance to handle it because he was killed? In fact, if you think about it, Uriah never knew he had been betrayed at all. He was dead before he knew anything about David, his wife, or Joab, and his comrades, and what they all did to him. God's grace shielded Uriah from all that hurt in this present life. So we might think that Uriah has no idea of what we've had to go through by the betrayal in our own lives here today. But there is someone who does know. Jesus Christ came into this world with full knowledge that he would one day be betrayed. And he stayed and he took it, knowing it would lead him to the cross. His own Jewish brethren betrayed him. Judas betrayed him. The re religious establishment betrayed him. His own disciples abandoned him. And as he hung on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did Jesus do anything to deserve this type of treatment? Of course not. Betrayal is something that no one deserves. But Jesus is one who understands what it's like to be betrayed, which means he understands what you've been through. One thing we can learn through a life, the lives of Jesus and Uriah is this. Doing the right thing doesn't always mean everything will go well. Doing the right thing doesn't always mean everything will go well. Uriah was so full of integrity that David used it against him to carry his own death sentence to Joab. But we remember Uriah for doing the right thing. We also remember Jesus for doing the right thing. What can we learn from how Jesus handled betrayal? He offers forgiveness. The Gospel of John tells us that God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus withstood the betrayals knowingly so he could offer forgiveness to all of us, even to those who betrayed him, if they would accept it. Have we tried to offer forgiveness to those who have betrayed us? That is the key to our own healing, as hard as that sounds. God can help us in this, but we must not use him as a last resort. He can give us the strength to do this, but we need to ask for his help. But what if you're not the one who was betrayed? What if we're the one who betrayed someone else's trust? What if we're more like David than Uriah? Have we ever dealt with what we've done to someone else who's close to us, knowing that God has seen it all? Jesus offers forgiveness for this as well. How many times have we rejected, betrayed, or abandoned God in our own lives, and we don't know what to do about it, and we carry that guilt with us? Forgiveness is still the key to healing. Jesus offers it. All we have to do is ask for it. Life can be a messy journey. We are called in Christ to do the right thing, but that doesn't always mean everything will go well. It is a difficult lesson to learn from Uriah's life. But God didn't forget Uriah. In fact, he honored him. In Proverbs chapter 10, it says, the memory of the righteous is blessed. Amen. And if you look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ, in the first chapter of Matthew, you will find Uriah's name in verse 6, listed as being part of that lineage. It says, David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. It wasn't because Uriah had a physical part in the line, but because of his integrity. That's how I wanted to be remembered by God, no matter what someone else had done to me. In closing today, I just need to ask, where are we this morning? Do we still carry the hurt of betrayal in our life and we've never been able to let it go? Do we carry the guilt and the shame of knowing of what we have betrayed someone else's confidence and never really dealt with it? Jesus wants us to let it go. No matter which side we're on, he wants to take the hurt 
and he wants to take the guilt and the shame. He offers healing, and he offers forgiveness. He endured the betrayal, knowing it was coming, to help us deal in our own lives with the betrayal. It's up to us to ask him, don't let the flame of God go out in your spiritual life. I'd like to pray as we close out this part, part of the service. And I just need to ask you, if you're dealing with any of this and you want prayer, I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but if you would just raise your hand, I want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. If you've been betrayed or you betrayed someone else, it doesn't matter. This is a family here. We can be honest with each other. I just want to pray for you. I see the hands. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I see the hands. I mean, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, it is so hard sometimes, this thing called life. We are so glad that we have a friend like you, a friend like Jesus, who would never betray us, never forsake us, who we can call on any time. But Lord, it hurts when others around us either betray us or, or we know that we betrayed someone else. Lord, the only way to fix it is to ask for you to help. We ask for your healing, Lord, no matter what side of the fence we're on. We ask for forgiveness. Lord, if we betrayed someone else, please help us to make that straight. Take the guilt and the shame away. Carry it to the cross. And Lord, if we've been betrayed, take that hurt. Take that hurt. Help us to move on. Help us to let it go. Lord, thank you so much that we can come to you. I thank you for those here who raise their hands. Lord, just give them peace and comfort this morning as they move on. Help them to deal with this. Help them to know that you're always right there beside them and you'll never forsake them and never leave them alone. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we bring our service to a close, we're going to be asking Deandra to come at this time. Deja to come at this time. And uh, I would just like to re-emphasize as she's coming the point that there is a Jesus who forgives when we hurt him. We do hurt Jesus too, you know. We do things that hurt Jesus. But Jesus said in his own prayer as he taught his disciples and us to pray, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So the preacher said, if you are hurt, yes, you're a human being and you feel it. It takes every bone, affect every muscle in you, every bone in you. But as Jesus Christ has forgive you, so he asks that we forgive those who hurt us. Don't carry it anymore. It's going to hurt you. The resentment the preacher said that you're carrying, it's going to hurt you even more than it's hurting the person who hurt you. So, my grandchildren, Sarah J, or my grandchild, Sarah J, has a song that she sang, Let It Go. Let it go. Let it go. I don't know. I just know that part. Let it go. Let it go. I say to you once again, it doesn't matter who, your husband, your wife, your children, your neighbor, whoever has caused you or is causing you hurt. 
why not just discuss it let it go for you my clay is hurting your own self may the lord help you to go home with this message on your heart and do as mary said to the people do what he tells you to do and see the result and there was result because wine was provided in galore so god help me and god help us all to let it go and let god takes control Deidre, today you have walked before to the altar. You had confessed your sins and God had forgiven you. You walk with the believers. You live within the context of the family of the church. But like the prodigal, your life had become and your environment seemed to have challenged you. And unfortunately, the enemy called you. And uh, even though you tried to resist, you listened. But like the sun, you have decided that for all that you have to bear, all the sad experiences that you have had, you're not going to stay out there any longer. You are not going to allow your life to remain in the state that is, it is in. Better is at home. And so, you have returned home. I want you to tell us in that in this minute what do you expect now that you have come home the Bible said the son did not ask for anything he submit to whatever was his father was going to do for he said I will arise I will go home and I will acknowledge where I am and my cause. May I ask you to step forward and tell us in one minute what you are expecting to do from here on. Good morning, everyone. As Pastor said, I was in the world and I was living a life of sin but somehow God through it all through the struggles that I have been through I had known ever since that there was a God and he was calling me for so long and I kept saying that I'm not ready and I've seen how I almost died on that hospital bed that night. And I said, God, I could have died and left my children. But you said, no. You said, no, you're not ready. You're giving me another chance. Yes. Another chance. And so I have to I have to be grateful because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I have to, I, I am coming back and I'm yes. coming back yes. strong Amen. because I have to show the world yes. that God is not dead. That's right, girl. That's He's right. my firm foundation. Oh, that's right. That's right. He's never failed or let me down yet. And the songwriter said he's faithful through generation. Yes. So I know that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. So 
This is my testimony this morning. And I'm asking you to continue to pray me up because you know that the devil tries to do things when you're coming in back in the, into the fall. And he will try to tempt you. But as I said, I'm coming in strong because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Thank you. No, come back. That is her own testimony. Amen. And you see, we, ju we judge by what we hear. For we can't see the heart. God sees the heart. But we judge by what you tell us. Everything that you say to us, I want you to know that she's still a human being. Amen. And she may err, right. but God forgave her then. God will always forgive her. But don't do anything because God, you know God is going to forgive you and you're going to do it. He said to the woman, woman, I forgive you, but don't go back and do it again. Right? May the Lord grant you all the strength and everything that is necessary. Today, like the Father, which represent Jehovah God, I stretch my hand. The Bible said, he hugged. His son, you're my daughter. He gave that robe. I don't have the robe here, but accept God's robe of righteousness Amen. over you. Amen. I don't have the ring, but don't forget the angel of the Lord is a ring around you Amen. and campeth round about you. Amen. The church will stand by you, but you will have to allow the church to know that you mean what you have said. Let the world continue to understand that when people change, they can change by the grace of God and they can maintain the balance in changing, right? May God bless you. Welcome back home to the family of the church. And the Bible said, the father called the host. Everybody in the house, and he said, come rejoice with me. For he, my son, she, my daughter, that went astray, has not come back. Isn't it time to rejoice? Amen. Let me hear Amen. you give it. Rejoice. May we stand to receive her, please? May I ask you to stand, please? He called the church. Brother Durban, I, I don't know. I don't know. You, you just sing a song. Uh, just just sing a song just do something we're getting ready for the offering here God's people have brought an offering for the cause of God we want to thank the work and witness team for for the contribution that they are going to be making towards the project that we're talking about the community project we want to thank the school project the NAS technology project and by the way we are going to be having graduation very soon that they're in the in different discipline thank mm -hmm. god for the church of the nazarene Amen. who is uh, sending on people into the working world for the last three years we send more than 200 people young people who are in the hotel industry and other areas working now through the heart entity uh, trust program we want you to continue to pray for us and continue to support us but as you sing the offering is going to be collected now and i wanted to just give deja your prayer and your continued support welcome god bless you my dear sister god bless you you are returned now as a full-fledged member of the church to carry out all the covenant that is you know of and you've been told to live by the order and the principle of the word of God and according to the doctrines of the Church of the Nazarene. God bless you and welcome back home. You can't go down there. You have to sit here for a minute because after the offering, then when members are going home, they'll have to come and shake your hands. Yes. 
we welcome you back that's what he said he said come 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 my son is back home come on everybody come on come on come on come back home that's what he said very excited let's pray father we give you thanks for this offering that your children will be given now we pray that they would be liberal in their giving and that the offering would be used for the building of the kingdom through the means that we use to build the kingdom bless and sanctify and multiply we give you thanks in jesus name amen we praise you jesus we praise you lord we dance for freedom we dance for joy liberation time liberation time liberation time is we praise because there will be no service later on on wednesday we will be going to assist the community with a project that is being done on the play field the time to begin there is i think nine o'clock and we can do one or two hours then on tuesday it is labor day nobody going to work on labor day it is said that we should plant trees so uh, after you plant your tree in the morning uh, i'm going to ask you to come out and uh, i want every member paul is going to be team will be here working and i want you to come and get some work done we're going to be doing some work on at the church here we're going to clean up we're going to clean down we're going to do everything so we're going to ask you to come out Wednesday night, you are going to hear some more announcement that will be made. So we're going to ask you to come out 7, uh, 15 on Wednesday evening because some of you will be going back to work. And we're going to be in here for an hour and we're just going to praise God. We're going to do the word of God and then you will hear some more of the announcement. God bless you and be with you. And may I uh, inform you last week sunday i ask you to pray for sister nancy sister williams today we pause for this moment of silence sister nancy Punzi. sister nancy punsi punsi amil amina almenia yeah williams Punzi. she said goodbye to us she was a real prayer warrior. I have visited her so often and up to the most recent before she died. I want to thank God for her life and the memory I have of her. May we pause for a minute of silence before we sing and go.
Sister Williams, you have been delivered from pain and heartache. According to our knowledge of your life lived, you are now resting until we see you in the by and by. May you rest until we come to see you in that better place. Mm -hmm. May her soul rest in peace. And may light continue to shine on her. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and bless you with his peace, both now and forevermore. I say goodbye. We're ready. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Liberation time, liberation time is